This is episode 13 of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. This is Jeff Kaiser. My guest for January 2021 is the owner of the former Miami record shop, one of our favorite record shops down in South Florida, Blue Note Records, Bob Perry. Bob, welcome on to the Florida Sound Archive. Great to have you. Thank you, Jeff. It's wonderful to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So we have so much to talk about. I can't wait to get started here with you. I know you spent a lot of years not just owning a record shop, but you also spent a lot of time working in promotion and for labels and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. let's kind of get things started with the early years, late 60s, early 70s. How did you get into the business? Well, I graduated high school. I went to school in Maine. I grew up and I was born in Portland. And I went to uh, uh, Westbrook. I mean, that's where I, where I lived in Westbrook. And I graduated Westbrook High in 66 and um, took about a year off. I uh, went to the Newport Folk Festivals in 66. I went, went back again in 67. And, um, yeah, I started doing some odd work. That, you know, it was a lot of, you know, main industrial lumber mills. And my uncles had worked in them. And, you know, they got me in and. I realized in a very short time what I didn't want to do. So um, <clears throat> one day I was just happened to be uh, going into town and I picked up a friend of mine and he got a, He said that he was working for um, um, Whirlpool, you know, it was a, a, re- a music distributor. I said, Whirlpool. I said, and he says, yeah, he says, we, uh, you know, we sell, you know, Whirlpool appliances were owned by RCA. So we have washer dryers. He says, but I work on the other end of the building, which is, distribution we sell records i said i'm there i saw i said you're looking for help and long story short i went and applied and uh i thought oh my god this would be great i got hired because you know i was kind of passionate i talked to the guy being a big collector and you know a music fan so it wasn't too difficult for me to get in there you know and um so i started basically in the warehouse sweeping pulling orders you know back then it was mono and stereo you know, so we had all the big chains like WT Grants, as well as all the mom and pop stores throughout New England, you know, so we were packing and shipping and, you know, distributing and accepting returns and, you know, just all warehouse work, basically. So that was my first shot at it. But the wonderful thing is I was around all these great music, you know, you know, I mean, new album comes in, the white album comes in for the first time, you open it up, the Beatles on VJ, uh, you know, the band. The, the first Who album, all these, you know, I got them when they were brand new, you know, out of the box, Aretha, uh, Aretha Arrives. Uh, so it was an exciting time. And I was a big blues uh, fanatic in the 60s, all through the 60s, folk and blues. So I would order all the records I couldn't get, you know, because, you know, it's Maine. I mean, it's not a lot of blues and a lot of black folks. I didn't have one in my high school in four years. So, um, uh, I basically, you know, I would order like, you know, the chess catalog, be it Muddy Waters or Howlin' Wolf or Sonny Boy or Little Walter and, and just, you know, so I was in heaven. Hell, I'd have worked for nothing. You know what I mean? This was just wonderful. So uh, that's basically how I started. That's where I, I got the, uh, you know, I got the bug, if you will, you know, about, about the record industry. And I realized after about a year, a year, well, not a year, year and a half to two years there, <clears throat> as much as I enjoyed it, it wasn't an opportunity to, you know, there was a sales manager and it was an assistant and then there wasn't a lot of room at the top, you know? So, uh, um, I took a vacation and I, I, a friend of mine had moved down here at the Hallandale and I left, I left in January. It was in January. I had about a week off and, uh, I came down here <clears throat> and the first night that I was here, we ended up going, uh, to some of you old timers will remember this, or you've read about it, the image, which was a great rock and roll club on Miami beach, you know, but down by the, uh, the Newport right on Collins. And I remember, um, it was, uh, that night was, uh, John Lee Hooker and the blues image were backing him up. And I, um, I, well, I mean, you know, it was like 12 below zero when I left in January and I'm down here in shorts and, you know, Aguya Beta, whatever, you know, and I'm like, whoa, I can dig this. And then we ended up like a few days later, we went to Pirates World to see um, Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green, you know, and I thought, man, this is great. So 
I went back home and I thought a lot about it. And I said, you know what? I packed up the Chevy. I put all my st- all my belongings, my KLH, my speakers, my 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 whole record collection, you know, in, in the trunk and a trailer. And I came down. And so that was about 69. So I came to Miami and um, um, <clears throat> my first job down here in the music business. For, first, I took a job at J.C. Penney's selling shoes, which, oh, God, on 163rd Street. That was probably the worst job I've ever had in my life. Um, and then uh, I took a Friday off, uh, called in sick, and I went down to Hialeah because I had, I had a couple of addresses and names. I had Henry Stone's name, who I didn't know from a can of paint, but, I mean, you know, my boss knew Henry from different conventions, so he gave me the name. And uh, I went down to see if I could find Henry Stone. So I found the distributor, Tone Distributors in Hialeah, legendary distributor that handled every independent label in the business, you know? Um, and uh, again, same situation. I went in there, I met this guy named Dave Benjamin, who was Henby's right-hand man. He was a sales manager. And I told him, look, I was in the record business in Maine. So I had a couple of years experience. I, I, I'm good in the warehouse. I'm good at pulling orders. I can buy records or whatever. I know a lot about. And the guy, the guy was really cool. He was very receptive, and he and he 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 hired me. Right, that was a Friday, and uh, I remember um, he said, "When can you start?" I said, "I can start right now," you know, because pennies didn't mean that too much to me. So I, um, uh, he said, "How about Monday?" I said, "Monday's fine." So I drove back up to pennies. I gave him my notice. They told me they were going to put me in rugs, and I said, "Yeah, you know, that's you know, that's not me," you know. And I started with Henry Stone in uh, 1969. And, uh, and it just kind of mushroomed from there. That was my, that was the beginning. I worked in the warehouse. I worked with a lot of, a lot of great, um, uh, not only artists who, cause we had a recording studio in the back uh, upstairs, you know, with Betty Wright cut clean up woman and Clarence Reed or Blowfly uh, did uh, doing my thing with nobody but you babe. And all the cast like little beaver, even Jocko or Dwayne Allman would go in and out. You know, we had every, all the music, you know, it's a studio. So everybody showed up at one time or another, you know. So, uh, so that, that, that was kind of an exciting time. You know, I was what, 19, 20 years old, you know, working for Henry Stone. I knew he was a legend. We had every label in the business. We had Motown, we had Warner Brothers, Atlantic, Electra, you know, uh, Fantasy, uh, Prestige, Chet, every, ABC, Polydor, you know. I was selling the Beatles on VJ to the Velvet Underground on Verb. So, it was wonderful, you know, and, and, and it was my domain. I was working, I, I later in about a year, I was a buyer. So I was bringing in blues uh, records. I was bringing in gospel records. I was buying, buying them for all of the mom and pop stores uh, up and down the, st- up and down the state, as well as, into, as well as nationally, we would sell to the Bahamas, you know, we transshipped everywhere. But uh, so I was kind of like a jack of all, you know, like a, doing a lot of different things. I was marketing selling records, dro- dropping orders off to mom and pop stores, you know, um, all over Overtown and the different areas like that. So it was a great hands-on experience. You know, Henry would say, hey, take this to the radio station, uh, WRBD up in Fort Lauderdale. It's an acetate of the new one, but we're putting out by Little Beaver next week or, you know, Purple Monday or Willie Claw, whatever, whoever, Steve Alamo, Brad Shapiro, had all these great producers who were doing soul funk records. So... I would hit the radio stations, you know, and I, you know, of course you'd go in there and you're dropping the stuff off. And then before you know it, you're having a couple of drinks with the guys afterwards. And it's like, wow, this is cool. And then I'd go to like WMBM, which was in Miami beach. Uh, that was a, a guy named Fred Hanner who was, you know, who was, I mean, Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I mean, if you broke a record there and we could break, re- we had great records. So I had, I mean, I was welcome with open arms when they saw me coming, they were like, Oh, what's Bob got, you know? So they would, they would play our records. We took very good care of all of the radio guys and all the record guys. They were all friends. They hung out at the at Tone at the warehouse. They came to our barbecues. They came, they were always in the warehouse. So, you know, that to me, it was, love is the drug, you know, that would, that, that, that was just it. I said, Oh my God, this is amazing. So anyway, I don't want to go too far off, but I mean, that's, that was the, the, the beginning. <laughs> no, thank you, Bob. And yeah, you know, Thinking about the time you were with Henry Stone, what's a memorable story that you have from Henry in that time period that really stay, stays true to you? Henry would always like, Henry was the most comfortable around black people. 
And, you know, in a, in a, in a lot of ways, I am too. I, you know, I've all, always have been, you know. Um, you know, there's no airs. It's just, it's just like Henry would be, would be in the front, in, in the, in the, uh, in the warehouse, would be talking and packing, shipping, whatever. But his head was always in the studio and making records. And he would always say, oh, let me get around my brothers again. You know, let me get around my brothers and try to rub, you rub elbows. You know, he was always, you know, and I always remember that. I mean, like James Brown would come in, would fly his jet, have his, you know, he would, he didn't fly, but he would, they would fly into Miami. And I mean, you know, Hialeah is right there. So James would, would come over to the studio and uh, just just a relationship that Henry had with all these all these great artists, you know, um, blues artists, and all and all the people that ran the record company, like Al Bell and Stax Records, you know, they would come in, you know, uh, the the Chess Brothers, Leonard and Phil Chess, Jerry Wexler at Atlantic, you know, who was, you know, who was the funkiest white Jewish boy cat I've ever met in my life, you know, I mean. You know, and, and I'd be in the I'd be coming back from a sales trip or something, and I'd walk into Dave or Henry's office and they say, Hey Bob, say hi to Leonard Chess, say hi to Phil Chess, say hi to Jerry Wexler, you know, say hi to Sid Nathan from King Records, you know, man who's responsible for James Brown, you know, or Duke Records. And these are all labels we we distributed, you know, so we were all in it together. So I thought, wow, you know, I can make a kind of make a name here, you know. And I would take them on the road. I'd take them locally to visit the mom and pop stores. And they liked that. But getting back, I mean, there's a hundred stories, you know. Um, Henry, Henry was just, he was funny. He was gracious. He had a heart as, as, as big as you could imagine. He, um, you know, he, he worked with the artists. He, he was a hands-on guy. He was, you know, he was the, probably the most, I think, the happiest when he was in the studio, you know. And uh, he loved coming out and, you know, kind of quizzing you about what you thought about the record, you know. And uh, I remember he would always mix we, in, in the studio. We had these little funky ass speakers. I mean, they were little tiny AM speakers. But he knew that that's how people listen to it in their cars. You know what I mean? And he would always mix it down and he'd mix it on a fucking, if it sounded good on those little AM speakers, cheap speakers, you know, then it would sound good. And we always had that, those killer bass lines, you know, uh, with, you know, Ron Bogdan and, and Little Beaver, you know, the high, you know, so they, those records, man, a lot of trouble. I mean, and they were, they were a lot of bottom too. So they sounded great on those speakers, but yeah, it's just a lot of, a lot of different, a lot of different stories, you know, some, I, some I'd rather not talk about. But. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, you think a lot of those musicians who work in the studio got the respect they deserved at that time? They they were resp they weren't really nationally known because you know again you were doing forty fives and their names weren't on the records except for the artist himself you know what I mean but right. those cats that were backing them up you know were were amazing musicians you know um, they do now they you know uh, the, the thanks to the English cats man the English guys you know, they brought back what they call Northern Soul where the the most obscure I mean they're not, they're not looking for the Motowns or the big you know they're looking for those really obscure and Miami is so damn collectible because there was so many great funk records that came out of here, you know, and they know every artist on there. So now there's books written on these session guys, you know, I mean, so, yeah, I, I feel now that they've got they've got the respect. Definitely. Yeah. You know, then there, we were all, you know, we we're all hanging out. We never thought this thing was, uh, you know, was going to be as big as it was. I remember the first time that uh, I promoted uh, Clean Up Woman. And, it, and I said, this thing has got legs, you know, meaning it's taken off, you know, this thing's going. And, it, you know, and I'm looking at the trades and billboard and cash box and record world. And I see this thing is going like 68 and taking 10 point, you know, to 50 to 37 to, to five to number one. I'm like, holy shit. And I knew we arrived because I remember I took one of my first vacations. I was down here for a couple of years and I flew to Logan. I wanted to go home to see my parents for Christmas. And it's like about 71. And I flew to Logan. When I got into Logan, I heard Clean Up Woman, you know, in the back. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, you know, we're onto something here. So it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, just a lot of, a lot of great, great, great memories. Uh, and uh, never thought those, those records. I mean, now, you know, you look back at Betty and Beaver and all, and Clarence and, and, and all of the greats that came out of, uh, out of Tone and TK, you know, KC later, you know, George and Gwen McRae and, um, the Benny Lattimore. I mean, they're 
all wonderful artists and, and great people, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it, was, it was an amazing time. You know, one thing that made me feel good while she was still alive, I don't know if you caught when they unsung the episode on Betty Wright. Yeah. And when I think about th those that were in that era in South Florida, her and they did a thing on disco. So obviously mm -hmm. they showed Casey mm -hmm. and the Sunshine Band. And uh, did you see that episode at all with Betty Wright? Uh I, I saw that one, but there wasn't a lot of Betty in it. Is, is that the one you, you talked or Maybe was, we're talking about a different one. Yeah, there was one, was, I guess, with about was, TK or something. And yeah, Betty, that, you know, there was a, yeah. there's some real bad blood there. So the Betty really, outside of a few, a few uh, glance, you know, a few sh uh, shots, she wasn't interviewed for that. Right. But maybe you're, you're talking about a different one or is that the yeah, same one? Yeah, well, there was one for her, but speaking about, it kind of felt to me, and again, outsider looking in, I wasn't there yeah. like. yeah there was a lot that was left out. So yeah. what are some of your memories of, uh, of Betty at that time? Well, Betty was, you know, very sweet. I mean, she was a young, sweet, pretty thing. And she had a, she had a, a love hate relationship with her producer at the time, which is Willie Clark. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into blaming who did what, but you know, I mean, there was some, there was some, I mean, Willie would go out on, uh, out on her or outside. She'd find out about it. I mean, and she came in, it's like, whoa, who the hell is that? Cause she was like, she, she put the whammy on him. I mean, she was like, you know, I'm talking about guns and you know, this was, this was, bull, this was no bullshit, man. Wow. She, wow. they would fight. And I mean, literally, you know, fists were flying. So there was always, always like that that tension around her and, you know, meanwhile, they were putting out great records. They worked together, but there was always, it was always very, very tense, you know? And, uh, you know, then, then there was some publishing, you know, things uh, that went on, you know, where this one's name shouldn't have been on there, you know? So, so, you know, Betty, Betty, like once, once that, once the, you know, the TK thing came in and she was moving, you know, Alston was, was the earlier label she and she, you know epic and other co companies were starting to court her and you could see the the walls were kind of crumbling a little bit she she never looked she never you know she never really uh i felt you know uh, uh trusted um you know henry and that's that's why she never she did not volunteer you could never get her to, to sit and say a one word about willie or like that documentary on deep city she wasn't in that. I mean, right. and she she was deep city. You know what I mean? That was the first sign was Betty. So I mean, there was she's she not talking to Willie all these years later. So it's always been a lot of bad blood, you know. Um, that she has her reasons, you know. I I, I know, but I'm I don't want to I don't want to sit here and go, and speculate and say why, even though sure. I, even though I you know I, I I know a little bit more. Uh, all I know is Betty, when I had my store, when I had Blue Note and I put the shingle out in 84, and we were in North Miami, North Miami Beach, where Betty lived, <clears throat> you know, with King Sporty. She would she would come into the store uh, regularly with her sister, not only to buy stuff, but also to check to see if anybody was copyright or stealing her music or, uh, you know, her image or whatever, which, you know, I'd always kind of help her with, you know, if there was a sample or something that one of my employees had heard and say, Hey, that's a Betty Wright song, you know, some, or I just wait for Betty to call me and say, do you have this record? Because I heard this, you know, so Betty, you know, we always had a good relationship. I was the promoter. I was getting those records on the radio. So, you know, nothing came between us. You know what I mean? I didn't own it. I didn't publish it. I didn't write it. I didn't play on it. I just, I just took it to radio. You know? So I always had a good relationship with uh, Timmy Thomas and uh, everybody got to live together and, you know, all those early records, you know, so that I promoted for Henry. So, yeah. Another person you mentioned was Clarence Reed. Blowfly. Yeah, Blowfly. Yeah. So I can only imagine that you have some memorable oh, he's, he was a character. stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's hundreds. I mean, you know, he was always, uh, when I had the store one time, uh, he was signed to, I think it was Alternative Tentacles uh, record, the Jello, uh, the label Jello Biafra. Right. And, uh, he would have to, he was going to New York and I think he did a show at uh, Tramps or something and Flea was going to be there and he was kind of, you know, like his career is on the move again. It was, it, he was always on, he was always doing great things down there. But, but he, uh, 
<clears throat> he would come in and he'd say, Bob, I got I to go to New York. You know, I'm going to be gone for about a week. Can you just hold this stuff for me? And like, you know, he'd give me a bag of like, yeah, personal belongings or whatever. I don't know. I didn't look at it, you know. So I, I put it in the back. And, and then about five or six days later, you know, it started permeating throughout the store because it was basically dirty laundry and it got real funky you know, real quick. And I'm like, I had a number and I was like, I was even before, cell, well, cell phones, you know, but I beep him and he'd call me back and I go, look, you got to, you know, I got to get this stuff out of here. Yeah, I'll be down in a few days, you know, so, uh, you know, and then, you know, he, he I mean, there were things that he, he gave me. I've got, I still got a, um, uh, he had a gold May uh, blowfly outfit that he, that he gave me, uh, uh, you know, and, and a, a, a record, of, uh, one of his records, uh, well, a lot of his records, he gave me test pressings and acetates and all kinds of stuff, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, he was just, he was, Clarence was funny as shit. He was just a great guy. He was always, always in the studio when he wasn't in the studio because all of those artists he wrote for, he wrote songs, you know, I mean, for everybody, you know, for KC, for all of them. And, um, uh, so he was either in the studio or he was in the back, in the, in the back of the warehouse on the piano. We had a little room back there, a little music room and it was real sparse, but, but every time I, if, if Clarence wasn't upstairs recording, he was sitting there writing or, or he was, you know, playing, playing piano, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he was, he, he was, a, he was a great guy. I always loved him. And when I had the store, it was like a second home. He'd always show up, you know, he'd pop in, you know, and, uh, you know, we got pictures of, of him, you know, he's, you know, shooting the bird at, at people. He would come in and sign records. One time we did an in-store for uh, Luther Campbell, you know, and we, you know, I, I brought Clarence in just to surprise Luther because I thought, you know, Clarence, this is the original rap dirty. You know what I mean? You think you think two live crew, you know, we want some pussy or something. I mean, here's Clarence doing uh, Harold Melvin's bad fuck. That's what you got. You got a bad fuck, you know? Uh, so, I mean, I brought, I brought Clarence out and then Luther looked and he goes, Oh my God, you know, the Godfather, you know, we're not worthy, you know? <laughs> so, they, I mean, that, that, that was, you know, there was so many of them, you know, I can't even begin to tell you. Yeah. I, I also know during the, what, early seventies, mid seventies, you spent some time at Criteria Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't imagine that time period and who you would have, bumped into in a hallway in a bathroom <laughs> in a studio in the parking lot so who were some of the folks that you kind of were rubbing elbows with or you just kind of had those run-ins with while you were at criteria oh my god well um how about uh, uh don henley uh the the eagles that would come in there and do overdubs for uh, you know for the the uh their early records on asylum um uh donny hathaway because basically criteria was atlantic south in other words it was a that was the studio tom dowd uh was was holding court there and jerry wexler by this time by by the mid by the early 70s had moved down and was working out of criteria uh and my office was at, on the second floor uh criteria the the guy who owned the studio was a guy named mac emmerman and um well, we made a deal with him. I was working for uh, WEA at the time. WEA is uh, W-E-A or Warner, Electra, and Atlantic Records. So I was a, what they call a three-bag promo rep. So I had, I was going out with Warner Brothers, Alice Cooper Records, you know, Electra, uh, you know, Bread and The Doors, and then Atlantic, it'd be from the Rolling Stones to Led Zeppelin to, you know, I mean, <laughs> they love seeing me come, you know. And meanwhile, Wexler and Dow were down there doing you know, Layla <laughs> recording, you know, um, um, you know, Jim Dickinson, uh, you know, Aretha Franklin, Donny Hathaway, Wexler would, would call me and say, hey, I, come on down, we're going to the Playboy Club. I, I just signed this new artist and he's opening for Little Richard on the Playboy Club on 79th Street in Miami. And I'd get there and it was an unknown cat named Donny Hathaway. And I'm like, I saw him once and I was like, holy shit. I mean, what? Still one of my all time favorite artists you know, like up there with Sam Cooke and, you know, and, and uh, James Carr, just one of the greats. Um, uh, but I mean, hundreds, you know, the BGs were, were coming around. Every, everybody was recording down there, you know, local, but a lot of national artists. One time <clears throat> Jerry was recording a quick story, uh, Doug Som of the Sir Douglas Quintet, you know, the great, great uh, Texas musician. Um, 
And uh, the album, I think, would later be Wallflower. They, they came out with it. And Dylan, it was, it was, a, it was a host of greats. I mean, Dr. John, uh, I, I, I eventually migrated to. I, I hung out with him all the time down here. We'd go to movie theaters and everything. We were, we were close. And I worked, you know, Ico, Ico and all of that stuff. But anyway, getting back to the Doug Psalm, Doug was in the studio and he had a Dr. John. It was an all-star session, you know. And Dylan came in to record uh, background. Uh, vocals like background are played on uh, wall on the title cut Wallflower. That's the son's uh, band's name too, Jacob. Anyway, um, Wexler came upstairs and said, "Hey Bob, can I borrow your office because I yeah I want to we got some contracts to do." You know, blah, blah, blah. I thought, okay, yeah, fine. So I walked out. He goes, "Oh, hey, say hi to Bob Dylan." I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, hi, Bob. What do you say? I'm like, God, amazing. So, you know, like getting back to it, I mean, you never knew who there was so many that would, you know, turn up. And of course, you know, and, and it was a popular spot. So radio people would show up, writers would show up, uh, reviewers, you know, people from the Times. It was always, you know, uh, a lot of great artists that were coming through. Just amazing, amazing time. And the producers, too. There were two producers that I loved. Uh, uh, there were brothers. It was Ronnie and Howard Albert. And if you look at the Layla album, you open it up, they're in there with Tom Dowd, you know, and they produced, they produced that album, you know, Tom engineered it. And, um, but Ronnie and Howard Albert, yeah, Steve Alamo. And um, uh, there was just so many greats. You know, Chris Blackwell would come in from Island Records, you know, because he, uh, he had some uh, artists that were, you know, a lot of the Jamaican cats, you know, the uh, Third World, stuff like that would come, come in and produce stuff, you know. Uh, in a circle, you know, with Jacob, Jacob Killer Miller. So it was on and on and on. There's hundreds. <laughs> yeah. So many, great, so many greats. So yeah. many, all across a lot of different genres of music. I mean, you mentioned Donny Hathaway, one of my also personal favorites as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so many really amazing people you had a chance to see. Now, you were how old at that time? Early 20s? Yeah, early 20s. Yeah, I was like 24, 24. Yeah, I was a young guy and I was uh, I was single still. And I was on the road with, uh, well, you can imagine Warner's Electra in Atlantic. Those artists would come through. Sometimes you'd have Todd Grundgren and Dr. John and Alice Cooper on one show. All three of them I represented. So, you know, I'd, I'd be taking the, taking the road with... Uh, you know, with, with them, you know, taking them to radio stations, you know, if they wanted to go, you know, if we were playing Tampa or Orlando, I would, you know, I would uh, say, Hey, look, we got a, we got an interview lined up with uh, WORJ or WLCY in Tampa or whatever the station was, you know, college stations, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, an, it was a great time and, you know, and, uh, and those artists were hot. I mean, you know, you know, Todd, nah, hello, it's me. And, and, you know, Dr. John's Ico Ico and Alice Cooper's Billion Dollar Babies. And, you know, I mean, we, we were selling tons of records, you know what I mean? It was one of, it was we, you know, it's like CBS, you know, Universal, MCA. We had that big machine behind us, you know, we had our own distribution, you know, our own marketing, our own promo guys, you know. So, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it was an exciting time, really a great time, you know. Did you have a mentor or someone guiding you along this journey or were you kind of just figuring this all out as you kind of went along? My heroes were always the guy, the great producers who did those records. You know, like I mentioned, Lennon and Phil Chess earlier, you know, the sound of Chess Studios, you know, um, 2120 South Michigan, even the Stones had a hit with that. That's the address of Chess. It's like the records to me were like religion. Like what, what are they trying to tell me? If I looked at little Walter records and I saw Willie Dixon's name or ransom Nolings or who are these people? And it, I just kept going down that, that rap, you know, and discovering, discovering all these guys. So, I mean, the chess brothers, Sid Nathan, a King, James Brown, Henry, Henry was one of those early ones. Wexler who hired me. I mean, when I was a kid and I bought, you know, in the 50s, I was buying the Clovers and the Coasters and Bobby Darren, and they were all Atlantic Atco artists, you know what I mean? And the Cardinals and the, you know, the Ravens. And the, um, and I remember getting those records and seeing Wexler's name on them, you know, like either produced it or he wrote it, or even Armand Erdogan, it would say Noguchi, which is Erdogan backwards. So it would say Wexler Noguchi, N-U-G-E-T-R-E, and Erdogan, you know, and I'm like, that was always like, who the hell? And then I find out later, it's, it's Ahmed. I met I met Ahmed, you know? Um, but certainly Wexler. And, and then I didn't, I don't think we talked about this earlier when I, how I got to Atlantic 
was, um, or WEA, WEA, had got the job at WEA, was I was on the air one night on a station in Miami called the, uh, the bus, the magic bus, WBUS, was 93.9 FM, later became Love 94 WLVE. I was doing a weekend show. The station was basically a progressive back then, very, very um, free form, you know. Uh, and uh, the music director was an English guy named Michael Dean. And uh, I came in um, and I did I did a blues show. I did. They had they had a great I mean, it was a great station. They played everything. They introduced bands like from Quartermass to King Crimson to er, all the early you know, progressive Pink Floyd and all when nobody would play that stuff, Traffic and Nick Drake and John Martin and Fairport Convention. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful station. I mean, in my spare time, I listened to it constantly because I always get turned on to things that I didn't know about. So I came in and I did a blues show. It kind of fit in with the rock because, you know, instead of playing the Rolling Stones, you got to move on Sticky Fingers. Mm-hmm. I played Mississippi Fred McDowell's version. So people would go, oh, wow, that's, that's where that came from. Or, you know, I played Sonny Boy Williamson's Baby, uh, instead of Led Zeppelin's, I'm going to bring it on home, you know, and it was the same song, and, you know, so, so it was kind of in it, and, and that's how I brought people I'm into the blues, you know, and, you know, but then I'd go deep, you know, I'd go into Delta and Lightning Hopkins and shit that I like, and that you should listen to, you need the shit you like, you know, that was my thing, you know, so I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going down that hole for a half 40 minutes, and I'm going to play some deep ass shit, you know, and I'll mix it, it's my show, it's my station, it's my records, so, <laughs> I'm on the air one night, guy calls me up late, it's like midnight, and I was on till like two. He says, hey, uh, can you play some um, Robert Johnson? I said, sure, man, I'm happy to. So we, the guy was really interested, he, he's talking, he, see, he mentioned that he was in the music business and that when he came to Miami, he, he, he always tuned in the station, he loved it, and he, he liked my show. And I said, oh, thanks. I, said, I told him, well, I'm in the music business also. He said, oh, yeah. He says, who do you work for? And back then it was Henry Stone because we distributed Atlantic. Uh, and I said, I said, Henry Stone. He said, oh, Tone? I go, yeah. He said, oh, that's my distributor. I said, oh, really? What label are you with? He says, Atlantic. And I'm thinking, okay, he's probably a sales rep with Atlantic. I said, what's your name? He says, Jerry Wexler. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> what are the odds? What are the chances? You're on the phone with Jerry Wexler. And I said, Mr. Wexler, oh, call me Jerry. And I, you know, we, we were talking and I told him, oh man, I'm going to say, like we talked about earlier, I had all those records as a kid and I'm just such a big fan. And, you know, I could tell he knew that I was coming to the threat from the heart. And I thought to myself, boy, would it be great if I had him to come down? You know, just a fleeting thought. And I said, Jerry, I said, would you like to come down and we'll do a, you know, because I'm thinking, look, he's into this shit. You know, he, this is the guy that, you know, recorded, the uh, you know, best, uh, you know, uh, Professor Longhair and all, and all these big Joe Turner and all these blues greats, you know, he wrote the book, he wrote the songs, he produced them. So cut to the three weeks later, he comes down with Jackie DeShannon, who he had just signed, you know, uh, to Atlantic. And um, he had two reel to reel tapes. He had just come in from L.A., and one of the real, you know, the real tapes was um, um, the Aretha Franklin. He had just finished the Amazing Grace album, uh, with, with, which they did in uh, L.A. with uh, James Cleveland. And the second one was the Gumbo album of Dr. John's legendary, you know, New Orleans Sessions, you know, with all the greats on there. And, uh, and we debuted those two records in addition to, uh, um, you know, you know, it, it I put together like some like Ray Charles stuff and I, and some Laverne Baker things and all the early stuff that he produced. And I let him go. I let him, you know, I let him uh, improvise. So, you know, we come out of the record, uh, Ray Charles drowning my own tears and a live version. You say that was cut in a ballpark in, in Atlanta, GA. We did it as a benefit for DAS or whatever. We did it for DAS in Memphis. He says, uh, you know, we did that in one take and that, you know, and then the Sam and Dave stories in the studio, you know, the Wilson Pickett at Muscle Shoals. And it was just Professor Longhair and it was magic. It was three hours of, of just listening to Jerry and I was just playing. I had three turntables and we talked like we're doing now and I, I cue something up and boom, we let it play. And it, it was, it, you know, 
And then a month later, they hired me to do Wii of. <laughs> Speaking of some of those other labels, did you ever have the opportunity to go to, let's say, Muscle Shoal Studios or Stax or Motown? I went, to, I went to Stax. I went to Stax. I went to um, uh, the Englewood Cliff Studios where they cut all the jazz grades, the Blue Note, um, uh, Rudy Van Gelder. <laughs> Uh, I also, the studio where they cut all the stylistics, uh, I went to Stax, Al Bell took me to Stax. Uh, yeah, just, you know, just to, just to tour it, you know, just wonderful, like, you know, exciting, you know? Yeah. I, I never, I never get the sun. I, that's my, that's one of my, my uh, bucket list, mm -hmm. you know? But, uh, but yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I went to, I went to a number of great ones. Yeah. You mentioned sun, which obviously more the, the country style and what have mm -hmm. you. And, uh, I didn't know this at the time until I guess 10, 15 years ago that once upon a time, Miami had some sort of rockabilly scene that was going on there. Oh, did, yeah. you ha did you have any awareness, knowledge of that scene <clears throat> and what that may have been like at that time? You know what? I, I didn't because, I mean, I was aware of it. I mean, I, I mean, it had a local scene. It was a local label that we used to distribute called Gulfstream. And they they had a lot of rockabilly stuff, but you know, in the late 60s, it, that stuff was hard to, I mean, it was great and nostalgic, you know, I mean, like, like you looked at rockabilly, like pumping piano with Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, and Carl Perkins and the Tennessee Three and, you know, Roy Orbison and even those early, you know, um, so, um, you know, uh, 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 that stuff, it, we used to distribute it, but it didn't, it didn't, unless it was a reissue label, like sh this guy named Shelby Singleton, who bought the Sun catalog and repackaged the Jerry Lees and the, and the caches, you know, and, re and on Sun, and that was the authentic, you know, they reissued them again in mono and stereo, and um, you could sell that, but it wasn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was a thriving scene down here at the time, you know, but I liked it. I mean, so the first 45 I ever bought in my life uh, was, uh, was a rockabilly. It was a uh, Jerry Lee Lewis High School Confidential with, uh, with Mamie Van Doren. It was a great movie. I have a, I have a lobby card in my office downstairs. It's the, like the, the, it's the actual lobby card from 1955 with Mamie Van Doren and, um, uh, you know, it, a, a, t a, t a teacher's nightmare, High School Confidential. It's still one of my absolute favorite records, you know. So I, I mean, I, I was, so I, I loved, I loved the rockabilly stuff. You know I mean? I bought, you know, I bought uh, Carl Perkins and you know, I bought Mona Lisa, Carl Mann. I bought Roy Orbison's Ooby Doobie. I mean, they, to me, they were, they were great songs. I love them. Then the early Elvis stuff, you know, you know, that's all right, mama, blue moon of Kentucky. I mean, those are great records, you know? Yeah. I completely agree. It just, it blew my mind because I feel like when people think of that kind of music, they don't always think of, South Florida, Miami. Yeah, <laughs> right. And it was a very vibrant scene. There's a, that label I told you about that we would distribute in the 60s, Gulfstream. There are records on that label now that are going for $1,000. I found a record uh, about a year ago, and it was a, it was a funk soul record on Gulfstream because they covered everything. They did gospel. They did blue. Didn't care. But they really, they loved rock and roll. They did a lot of rockabilly. But the funk records, there's funk records on there. I sold to, I sold uh, for six seven hundred dollars one forty five. You know, uh, we talked earlier about you said, is there one particular uh, album that, that, you know, you wouldn't part with or stuff, you know, and uh, there's a record on. And ironically, it's on Gulfstream. I couldn't think of it the other day, but it's on Gulfstream. It's a, the artist's name is uh, Lucia Pamela. And if anybody's never heard of her, you should check her out. You can go to YouTube or Discogs, but it's L-U-C-I-A Pamela. Uh, and uh, she has an album on Gulfstream called Into mm -hmm. Outer Space. And um uh, she does a thing called walking on the moon, which I, if you haven't heard it, it, you know, it'll knock your dick in the dirt. Oh, pardon. Sorry. I mean, it's that, it's that good. Uh, so uh, Lucia Pamela uh, walking on the moon on Gulfstream, forget trying to find it. I have the original one with the comic book, had a comic book in it. And it's, it's, it's gives whole new meaning to DIY. Do it just, I mean, it's just like crazy. It's like, it's like from another planet. I mean, it almost makes sun Ra like uh, Herman's Hermits. I mean, that's how outside it is. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, Lucia Pamela, anyway. <laughs> and it's Gulfstream, so that's one of my favorite records. Yeah. 
Well, thanks for sharing that. I was always really curious to hear maybe someone that remembered some of that time period and what have you. So, you know, you spoke about the time with Atlantic and mm-hmm. I, kn- I know at some point you also had the opportunity to do some stuff with Island Records as well. Correct. Yeah, I, I worked uh, when I left uh, WIA, uh, I, I got a really good opportunity to work for a, a company uh, called, uh, well, the company was owned by uh, two brothers, uh, Amos and Ira Heilicker. So the distributor was called Heilicker Brothers. They were located in Opelika next to the airport. And we, we were like what Henry was 10 years earlier. They, we got all the independent labels, heavily, very you know, financially sound, funded, paid their bills. So I took over for Heilicker Brothers. And Heilicker Brothers distributed you know, uh, Fantasy, Prestige, Bell, uh, Arista, uh, Mercury, all the labels, and Island, Casablanca, on and on. So... I took over. I, I took over at least thirty different labels, and I was the head of promotion for those labels. You know, now naturally, I had a little. I had a couple of people that were under me that that would, would, would I give them the secondary markets to run with. You know, and the, the major stuff, whether it was you know Kiss or Bob Marley or whatever, I would take care. I'd do that. You know, so that's the that was in the uh, mid seventies, and that was the first time I had a chance to work with um, the Island. The people at Island, they would call me every week and, you know, got a chance to meet Chris Blackwell and got a chance to meet Bob. You know, Bob was Bob would do different show. I mean, when he came off tour, let's say, because back then he was he was so big in Europe that he didn't, you know, and over here, nobody wanted to play the goddamn records. You know, they, they could play. I could see clearly now or I shot the sheriff by Clapton, but they wouldn't play a Bob Marley record. I know because I used to go to the radio station with a 45, like, let's say, no woman, no cry. Right. Good luck. You know, back in the fucking disco era, and I'm bringing no woman, no cry, and they look at me like, "What the fuck? Are you kidding me? This is a black record, Bob." I'm saying, and they're all black. You know, you know, give me a fucking break. But it was tough. It was tough to get Marley. You know, yeah, you get college play, and you get some of the free form stations. You know, and and school, you get VUM in Miami. You get the bus, the Magic Bus, or whatever to play some of that stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, you wanted to cross it over. You wanted to, you wanted to, you know, make it a hit, you know, and that, that's where the money was, you know. And it was always an incentive. If you did get it on top 40, you could get a little extra, a little, little extra money or in some cases a lot of extra money. But, uh, but yeah, that, that was the beginning. I met Bob at the, uh, I think the first time I met him was at a NARM convention. And NARM stood for National Association of Record Merchandises. And every other year, they would hold a hold a um, a um, meet, meeting uh, and bring in all the major retailers. You know, the Sam Goodies and the, uh, all the big, you know, tower. Well, not well, not tower before tower, but all, all the major retailers from around the country, and uh, and and the rack jobbers and the one stops, and they would all convene on Miami Beach at the old Diplomat in Hollywood. And uh, and then wh- whoever the labels were, they would have a, a a Warner Brothers night, an Island night, and you know, and a uh, uh, CBS night, you know, and they would bring in all their artists, you know, to play. Well, we had an island night and it was Bob, you know, so I, I remember, you know, going back there, meeting him for the first time, you know, and uh, and just, you know, just exchanging, and as I, you know, told him I had, <clears throat> if you have a need, you know, just just whatever I could do. I'm a local promo guy. Here's my card. If there's anything, anything you ever need or whatever. So we stayed in touch. You know, we when he'd come to Miami, he'd call um, and, you um, you know, hit me to what he was working. And um, uh, a, f- a few years later, <clears throat> um, I had moved to Boston and then I had come back. And when I came back, I got a job with Warner Brothers, just Warner Brothers. I'm talking like 1979 now. And, but Warner Brothers had signed a, a deal with Island to distribute it. And Bob, uh, Bob had just put out uh, Uprising. You know that, which is you know his last album, and I got a call from the New York office in um, uh, Island Records, and they gave me, they told me uh, that Bob was coming into Miami because you know he had a home that he bought for his mother here, uh, Sedella in South South Miami, and uh, and when he would come off like tour or Europe or the I wherever, he would come and, and relax for a few days, chill, you know. So they said, well, can you pick them up? And I'm like, yeah, of course, you know. So I went to the airport. Well, I, at the time I, at the time the album came out, let me preface this. 
when the album came out, they they put out a single and a, and a maxi single, a 12 inch of one of the tracks, which I thought was the absolute right track. Could you be loved? And they put a great remix out of it. You know, could you be, could you be, could you be? Loved? And I took it to radio and I had, this is one time where I was so glad. I, I got the first top 40 major station in America to play. Could you be loved? And that was uh, uh, Power 96 or 96X. Well, it wasn't 96X. It was Power 96 in Miami. And they were playing that extended version. And I knew the program director very well. He put it on for me, you know. So when I found out that I was going to pick Bob Marley up at the airport, I called him. And I said, look, I'm going to pick Marley up. I'm going to be on the Dolphin at about 2.15. Uh, if you put the record on. You know, I, I can't 100% guarantee it, but I'll do everything I can to get Marley to the radio station so you guys can score an interview, you know? Oh, that'd be great. So I picked up Bob, and I and uh, his, he, at the time he was traveling with his manager, Danny Sims, and uh, and Rita, and his best friend, his uh, boyhood friend named Skills Cole, who he took on tour just to play soccer, to play, you know, football with, you know? Uh, so I picked up, I picked up the four and, uh, we're in, I got a little Toyota and we're in the car. I get on the dolphin. It's two ten. I hear, could you be loving? I get it on. And I look over at Bob and he's stuck. He's got this sly grin on his face. And I just said, Hey, well, Hey Bob, would you want to maybe go by later on tonight or something? We can go, you know, say, Hey, play some records, DJ, whatever. But yeah, man. I said, cool. So we, um, needless to say, I didn't take him. I didn't take him to Sedella's house. I took him to my house. I lived in Miami Lakes at the time, so I was five minutes from the airport, right? I just right up the right up the Palmetto, and uh, I took it on my house, and I had radio guys there, musicians. I brought in a guy from Boston, WBC, who was also playing the record, and I invited the people who who helped him and helped me get that record on the radio, and nobody else. If you didn't play the goddamn record, then I you weren't invited. You know, I'm sorry, you know. And Bob came in, the whole crew came in. First thing he did was he started kicking a soccer ball, took it outside. I was on a lake and him and skills were playing uh, soccer in the back. And uh, we had, we had great music playing, needless to say. He made his way into the house, met, met the radio people, took photos with them, you know, um, signed things, you know, got into my den and started pulling records, you know. I asked Bob, I said, Bob, what, what do you listen to? What re reggae stuff that you like right now? And he looked at me and he says, Aswad, man, live and direct, Aswad. And I thought, okay. So he turned me on to that. And then I had a record that somebody had given me that I hadn't listened to yet, and he grabbed it. And it was an English band by, by the name of The Ruts. And, um, and uh, I think it was called Night in the Ruts, you know? And it was kind of a punky ska band, you know, that he liked in England. And... Uh, you know, so he pulled that and, he, you know, we, I have pictures of him and I just in the office, you know, like with the records like you have behind you, uh, just just pulling and, and listening. And we spent spent the whole day and into the evening. And we I don't know where where his his dope came from, but it was there <laughs> when we got off the plane. I didn't see it. But when I got to my house, there was a bucket, you know, <laughs> And we just, you know, we just drank and smoked and had a great time and 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 listened to music and and you know, signed things and and dealt, you know, when people were playing music. It was a wonderful afternoon, and we ended up going to that radio station at night and we did the interview. We did we did uh, about two hours on the air, and uh, that was great. We just had the, the monitors, so we didn't have to wear the he didn't have to wear the cans. And the uh, I remember um, the the switchboard was like a Christmas tree. It was just the lights were going flickering, flickering. Because once they found out Bob was on the air, was on the radio locally, it's like everybody that called, you know, either knew him, knew his, knew a cousin or, you know, was from Kingston or, you know, so the Jamaican community was like, wow. So, and Bob was playing Motown records and Curtis Mayfield records, who he loves. And uh, yeah, I just remember that as, as one of those magical nights. And, I, and, and needless to say, uh, three weeks later, Could You Be Loved was massive in the clubs. And it was a massive hit and it drove that album. It, it drove people to that album who normally wouldn't buy that album, you know? So, uh, you know, that's still one of my all time favorite albums, Uprising, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, he was gone not long later, you know, not too long later. Matter of fact, I'll tell you on that, this is a real quick story. <clears throat> um, 
I he spent the weekend after we did this radio show, which was a Sunday night on uh, Power ninety six. I I took him to um, I took him early in the early hours. I took him to Sedella's house, dropped him off, and his manager Danny. And then I had to pick him up Monday because I I had to get him to the airport Monday early Monday to because uh, he was opening for the Commodores at Madison Square Garden opening. So uh, I went to pick him up, and um, he he was really upset about there was um, um, an, the uh, they put his twelve inch in a in a in like a disco sleeve and the sleeve was very racy. In other words, it had a woman's panties on one side and a guy with a muscle on the other side. Like, and you know, he was pissed. And from what I could gather, because his patois, he wasn't speaking English. He was, you know, you know, but he had, um, he had Chris on the other line, Blackwell. And, um, he wanted, he didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, that's okay on a Grace Jones record but it's not okay on a Bob Marley record. You know what I mean? I mean, pull up to the bumper. You could put that, that, that picture, you know, in your long black limousine, but you're not going to cheapen his image and put it, you know. And I got on the phone with Chris and he says, look, it's just a marketing thing. We're not going to do it. And so I told Bob, look, it, that's just a, a mock-up more or less. They're not going to put it in that sleeve, you know, and, uh, and calmed him down because we had to get our ass out of there and go to the airport. But that's a true story, you know, that little anecdote behind the scenes where Bob, and, and to, to this day, all this bullshit with his fucking toothpaste and all, he would have none of that shit. None of it. None. Or the amp and, you know, go to a flea market. Like, you know, they're, they're copying, they're, they're profiting on his image, you know, and bullshit. He wouldn't have had, you know, that was the last thing he did, man. God, I, I mean, I, I, I was with him for three days with the same outfit he had on, you know what I mean? Me too. <laughs> we went to bed at so I, you know, Bob wasn't that. Ain't, that ain't Bob's thing, man. No, nah, not at all. Fuck that. But I, 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 anyways, we get to we get to the airport. Got got him off. I drove home. I got back on the uh, on the dolphin, and I thought, wow, what a whirlwind, man. With three days with Bob and the radio and the people at the house, and we got records played in Boston and here and that, you know, and good in New York, KTU and. Other people are adding it around the country in San Francisco, all over the fucking country. And then I got a call from Danny, his manager. Um, they, he opened for the Commodores on Thursday. Friday, he was jogging in the park. He collapsed. They took him to Sloan Kettering, and that's when they diagnosed the tumor in his, in his foot, you know, because um, he Rastafarian, you know, he could he didn't want to, they wanted, they seen it earlier and they wanted to, uh, you know, cut it, you know, and, but he, he wouldn't do that. And, uh, but ironically, I was with him the week that, that weekend. And then I got a call. I took him to the airport on Monday and I got a call on Thursday, on Friday, because Thursday he played. If you look at your itinerary, Thursday night that he opened for the Commodores. And, and the next day is when they took him to Sloan Kettering after he collapsed in the park and diagnosed with the tumor. And the rest is history, as they say. I think he played one more gig after that. He played the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh. And I have that album. And if you listen to that album, man, you know, if you can, it's it, the end is near. And but yet, yet it, it's a, it's power. It's the most I can't listen to it because, you know, I, I choke up just thinking about it. But um, I have it, you know, and I have two of them. Yeah. One I haven't even opened. I just got two. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, that that was it. And you know what? I had no idea. Bob was gracious was wonderful was spirited uh, i'll show you i'll show you i'll send you some pictures just so you can see this was this was a week before the diagnosis and i was with him that weekend i probably got the last pictures he ever did some of them i was going to ask do you remember what the last conversation was like with you and bob um yeah we were just in the office talking about influences and and um that's when I asked him, I, I wanted to know what he liked in reggae, what he was listening to when he, when he said um, Oswald. And uh, we were playing the Ruts record. Uh, just, you know, you know, there was so many people and I wanted, I wanted, you know, Bob to, you know, I didn't want to just get him in a corner and, you know, t you know, talk is, you know, because, because uh, Bob was a free spirit, you know, he moved around a lot, you know, he, he, he was always, you know, he, he, he never sitting still, you know, 
Uh, so, I mean, he just moved to, through the house, you know, somebody from Peru made some ceviche and, you know, there was great music, acoustic music. He was singing, he was smoking, he was dancing, he was playing soccer. Um, but it was just, you know, I, I let it, let it happen. You know, it was just like, you know, just, I, you know what I did do? He can't, he, 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 um, I had all my records in the back and I mean, in the office and as he was pulling stuff, I had this record that I got from, uh, Chris Blackwell, from, well, from Ireland. They sent me, it was a box set. It was a thick box and it was all uh, burlap, like, like the burlap was hanging down from it. But it was a limited edition of Rastaman Vibration. And it was, you know, it was like an inch and a half thick because it had all these tchotchkes on the inside. You know, it had like a, a tour a tour book. It had like a little baseball cards of Bob, you know, reviews from, um, you know, English newspapers, you know, uh, of, of his concerts. Uh, you know, photos and whatever, an eight by 10 publicity photo. So they sent it to me and he saw that and he pulled it out. And I said, I know you got one. He said, oh yeah, man. And, and I said, would you sign it? And I, you know, all these years, I, I never did that. I, you know, I was around every, you know, but, and there's a lot of them I didn't take pictures, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, geez, I wish I did, you know, but, you know, it wasn't like, you know, I was, the, I was the promo. I was the gig. Come on, let's go. Yeah. I sign it. Oh, would you sign, you know, I mean, you know, I worked with Manilow. I didn't want that signature. You know, <laughs> you know with all respect, I mean, you know, it's great and all, but you know, it, it didn't, you know, that didn't mean anything. You know, uh, Bob did. So when he pulled that record off my shelf, I said, "Would you sign it?" And I sure didn't ask him what, tell him what to, you know. I just said, "Would you?" You know, it's like I'd have artists in the store. They'd come in, they'd sign. There was always something clever, whether it was ODB from Wu Tang, or uh, you know. Uh, what the hell was the other group that came in that I love? A group called Sebado. These guys were crazy, you know. They, I mean, this just wonderful. But I gave, I gave Bob took the record and he signed it. Uh, he just put one love, Bob Marley, and that's needless to say, is priceless. That's one. I had a Japanese guy come over last year and he says, "How much?" I go, "Yeah, right." <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> if you only knew. But uh, yeah, so I mean, just a lot of little conversations, you know. Yeah. Sure. In your time working for all the for the labels and such, did you have any opportunity to travel abroad overseas and check out any of those music scenes and artists and what have you? I, you know what? I, I did go over there, uh, but not for the record companies. Um, so uh, they took care of me. I mean, they they put me up. I, I, I won this when I was telling you earlier, when I was working for Heilicke Brothers, there was a contest. Um, they had a, a kiss hadn't broken. There was no rock and roll all night yet. You know what I mean? And it was everything. It was like, and they wanted Kiss. This Neil Bogart, who started Casablanca, wanted Kiss in the big way and want Donna Summer and wanted, you know, this was before the village people, you know, but but uh, there was a number of things on, on Casablanca that didn't shit. But when Kiss came along, Neil, Neil knew how to market that stuff, you know, because he marketed all the bubble. He worked for uh, Cameo Parkway and um and um uh, you know buddha one two three red light yummy 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 you know he knew how to market pop records you know and he he got something with kiss you know what i mean so they they did this thing called the last promotion contest you know just like the last picture show at the time and uh the main prize and this is this isn't like 74 dollars or whatever first second 73 whatever kiss first album and the first prize was uh, ten thousand four hundred dollars. So, needless to say, I dropped everything to work that worked those Kiss records. But it wasn't just Kiss; it was James and Bobby Purify. It was all these different artists. Donna Summer that they had signed. They would so they would put out records every out of the week, and you had to run with them and get them. Whoever had the most stations, like you know the Billboard station, what they call Parallel One, major radio stations in a major market, you got points. Needless to say, after four months, I won the ten thousand four hundred, and I got I I collected. They had some they had some cash flow problems, but they sent me two hundred bucks a week for a year, and uh, I ended up my wife and I spending uh, a month in Europe. We went to uh, London, uh, went to Rome, we went to uh, Greece, and we went to Paris. The compliments of the record company. You know? <laughs> And that, that was like, that was like nothing else, you know, that nothing else in the world. We had such a great time. Thanks to, you know, that, those are, those are like some of the, the great uh, incentives, you know, I mean, that stuff doesn't exist today. It was, that was just an era where that was like total excess, you know. 
What kind of records did you come back with after traveling? Oh places? man, forget about it. I I, I was in uh, I was on the Champs Elysees and I bought Sonny Boy Williamson, uh, a ch uh, like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, French records uh, on Bethe Marconi uh, of of records that I didn't have. Some of them had alternate covers or alternate. So everywhere I went, you know, London. I went to Doe Bells. I went to the jazz places. Uh, my buddy Michael Dean was living in London at the time. So I hooked up with him in Piccadilly. We stayed at the Savoy. I mean, good Lord, the Savoy, you know, they come in, they knock on the door, they open the doors right away. And me and I was sitting there smoking some West Indian, nice Indian hemp. And they come in and they're cool as hell. They just clean the room and everything, you know, so, you know, in Paris, you know, we, you know, Charles de Gaulle, we, uh, it was just wonderful, you know, record, record. I mean, I, I I'm so grateful that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it took, I, I had a great time, but my wife and I had a wonderful time and we were young, you know, we were young and we were enjoying it, but I worked for it. You know, I worked hard, you know, I, I took it very seriously, you know, uh, record promotion was serious shit. And, uh, you know, I'm 73, I'll be 73 in August. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I've had my share of, you know, abuses in that, but you know, in the back of my head, I was, nah, it's not time to go to bed. <laughs> Let's go home. You know? So now I'm, I'm a teetotaler. I'm, I'm like, you know, Eh, a little rum maybe now and then. <laughs> Thinking about that that time and how old you are now. Yeah. What would the 70-year-old, 73-year-old Bob yeah. tell the 20, 30-year-old Bob at that time? Just mm -hmm. would you have done anything differently knowing what you know now? I would have probably uh, invested maybe a little, saved a little more, but you know what? I, I don't, I don't, you know, think about it. You know what I mean? The fact you ask, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I have a beautiful home. I'm thank God. My, my kids are healthy. My grandkids are fine. Um, and if I was, if I was to offer any advice, I would say, uh, no, no regrets whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I would just say to anybody, um, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. What's in your heart. I don't give a shit what it is, whether it's, you know, picking garbage or, you know, be the best, you you know, if you, if you're passionate about it, wonderful, go for it. But, you know, life's too freaking short. I mean, I, I look back and I mean, every, you know, even to this day, I mean, you know, yesterday I was out digging, looking for stuff, you know, uh, last year <clears throat> I found two, I found two amazing paintings by a fifties, uh, a pinup artist named Gil Elvgren, E-L-V-G-R-E-N. I didn't know him, him from anybody. Uh, but I took him home and I paid, uh, they were marked 10 and 10, and I offered the lady 25 for the paintings. And uh, I, I, I took them home, and I mean, you know, I, I said, I'm going to put these up, man. They were like, you know, sexy uh, pinup art, you know. And my wife said, did you look them up? I said, yeah, but I couldn't find nothing on them. And I spelled the name wrong. I spelled it E-L-G-R-E-N, and it turns out it was E-L-V-G-R-E-N, -E L Gren. And when I put that name in, it was like, holy crap there were 30 pages on this guy he's the norman rockwell of pinup art all right i mean there's petty and there's um uh vargas but but elgrin is at the top of the heat i consign those to heritage which you know heritage sells you know in, in houston kurt cobain's and hendrix's guitars and you know and elvis's jumpsuits and whatever i, I consigned them to heritage and they went for ninety thousand dollars <laughs> so my <laughs> antiques roadshow moment they say what's the best record i said it wasn't it was a 20 12 dollars and 50 cents i paid for for uh, each i paid 25 dollars. i threw them in the back of my my van and you know they, i'm on the way home and they're sliding back i had no idea to it to it and it took it looked like i just did research and four or five six months later yeah I said, I said, because I had people offering me. The first offer came from a Minneapolis dealer who deals in Elgin, and he said uh, uh, his wife flew in. I said, no, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm saying no, no. We just want to look at them. And when she looked at them, she says, these are never, I've never seen these. So I've seen all of Elgin's work. These, so they were lost, and I found, and I found them for twenty five bucks, and uh, she offered me forty five thousand. And I looked at my wife like, we paid twenty five for them, you know. So. That was exciting. <laughs> That's a good story. No, yes. that's, 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 <laughs> so hey, how can I go playing? You know what I mean? I was out, you know, I'm still, I'm still out there digging. <laughs> you mentioned following yeah. your dreams. So yeah. was one of your dreams 
to start your own record shop or did that kind of happen just based upon just your love for music and record collecting and yeah, that sort of thing? It, it did. Yeah. Uh, Blue Note came about as a result of 23, 24 years in, in marketing and promotion. You know, like so well, I mean, sales at first and then marketing and then distribution. And then the, what, 12, 14, 15 years in promotion, uh, 20 years in promotion, whatever. But it got to the point that uh, there was a payola scandal in the 80s, in the, in the early 80s, where, and I was an independent record promoter, so everybody kind of get, you know, get cut off at the knees, you know, like, you, you know, and, and it dried up. You know what I mean? It was like I was working for, I had, I, because of all of my experience in music, I had accounts like Warner Brothers, Polydor, Island, Atlantic, uh, RCA. I was working through, through managers, through publishers, through record companies. So I had all these accounts coming in. I had an office in Miami Lakes, you know, had a pool table in the office. I mean, I was like, you know, we were rolling. You know what I mean? I had, a, I was driving an XK 140 1956 Jaguar and I had a Mercedes out in the front. I mean, it, it was one. Let's go. You know, <laughs> where do we go next? And um uh, Everything got, everything died. Everything died. And um, I was on the road one day. I was at a radio station in Orlando when my wife called me and said, I just had to write out a check for $300 for these blues records that you ordered. She says, Jesus, why don't you open a store? And, and, and you know, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's okay with her. And I was thinking of it. I was thinking, you know what? I'd like to open. I can still do promotion. But I need, you know, I'd like to have a little something, you know, like park my you know, sit down and get on the phones and talk to radio stations, get a few records played. Hey, somebody comes in the door, which is exactly what happened because my first show was a shoebox. It was 500 square feet and I'd be on the phones promoting records and somebody would come in and I'd go, oh yeah, the jazz over here, there's blues and gospel over here, Latin, whatever, and show them that, you know, and then when they were ready, I'd say, hold on. And I'd go out front and it was just me, you know, I'd, I'd ring them up. And, Thank you. Wait for the next person. So that's how it started. Blue Note started on Dixie Highway, uh, and um, and I like and it was wasn't before long wasn't long that after uh, in the first year, I, I was really on the on the on the front, you know, more than I was in the back promoting, and I kind of liked that, you know. So I, um, I mean, I was close to a high school. I was close to North Miami, so we would I would bring in all these twelve inches, you know, like LL Cool J, Ring the Bells, and the hip hop thing was starting, you know, we would put cardboard out front. The kids would do like little break beat stuff and, you know, span and, and the kids were doing break dancing and everything. And um, I was getting DJs and promos from a lot of records, uh, radio stations and things like that. So I had, you know, I could put them out a couple of bucks, two or three bucks cheap. So trying to, you know, get, you know, uh, you know, bury the comp, uh, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the competition, if you will. So I, I, um, uh, you know, from there, uh, I, I, I went to, I lived, I lived off of 100, I lived at 166, so I used to get on 163rd. So one day I went down 163rd and I saw there was a, an opening for, uh, you know, the old record land uh, was going out of business in North Miami Beach. So that was a big place. You know, that was like, I'm going from 500 now to uh, 2,500, but I needed it. I needed it. And um, so I moved, when I parlay, when I moved into the, 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 the record land store, put and hung the shingle you know it was right away i mean you know i got all that traffic and all that you know it was a whole a whole different ball game so um yeah i mean that that's that's basically how that came about you know i i i uh, i wanted to open a store and i was hoping it would do good and uh, and it did it did it did for 25 years i had you know great people i had michael dean from yardbird i had leslie from open books and records um uh, i had lindell trocard who was a uh, cbs a and r rep who was booking shows at Churchill's and we were bringing, bringing artists in for, in, you know, in stores. I became a billboard reporter. I was reporting at SoundScan. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I had the re reputation and the respect of all of the labels. And I mean, every VP, every producer you could ever imagine, you can only imagine that came through that store. I thought I met people along the way before that. Everybody came in that store. I had Joe Boyd come in the store. Joe Boyd, produced the first Pink Floyd. He did R.E.M.'s album, first album. He did uh, Nick Drake and Fairport Convention. He did John Martin. I mean, the caliber, the, the, the people that would come in and the letters that I would get, thanking, thanking the, like, like them would say, they'd say, you know, sometimes we do these records in a vacuum and we don't, 
think anybody is, is out there who's listening to it. And then I'll come into a store like yours and I see the displays and I see, I see the passion that your, your employees have. Cause I, I always brought in people. If they didn't share that, then they didn't work. You know what I mean? I mean, I always brought, I could see uh, myself and a lot of the employees, you know, like, you know, just that hunger and that, and the knowledge, you know, and that was the great thing about the store. It was like, you know, before, uh, you know, uh, Google and, 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 you know, looking everything up, you know, we, we could, you know, you know, we knew we still, we still know all my employees, man. I had a guy that was in Baltimore, Michael Arlt, who was one of my first hires. And the guy was brilliant. You know, uh, he was a musician. He, he knew every, every nuance could tell you every beach boy song flip side, a guy named Arturo Gomez, who was known as a rhythm rocker. He, uh, he's now programming a radio station in Denver, a jazz Latin radio station. Uh, he worked on WDNA for a number of years, volunteering. He did a show called The Rhythm Rocker, where he, he had he had hip hop groups like Wu Tang, everybody in every week, so that he would bring them up to the up to the store, you know. And uh, you know, Jam Master J from Run DMC, uh, ODB, uh, Pit Bull, when they even before they were signed, you know, Rick Ross, DJ Khaled, all those people, uh, um, uh, Missy Elliott, um, you know, Timbaland. Uh, CeeLo from um, uh, Goody Mob, you know, CeeLo would come in. I think I, I mentioned earlier about he'd be looking for Black Sabbath records. So it was never dull. I mean, you know, it was always wonderful, you know, as Snoop Dogg came in and, you know, hung out half the day with Snoop and, uh, and Suge Knight, you know, from Death Row Records, you know, the fascinating cats, man. Great stories. They loved us because we, we, you know, we were there. We knew we did displays. They could do whatever they want. So yeah, the 25 years, I mean, it wasn't, it, it was just a whole new, it, you know, I, I never could have imagined how great it could have been, you know, L getting up every day and going in and just show me what, what you know, this is, ex what's going to happen. And it was never dull, never. It's my understanding from looking at a lot of your photos mm. from all the years of Blue Note that Sun Ra also came into your shop and mm -hmm. him being one of the most iconic and free jazz and just right. that whole thing. Uh, what was that like having him in your store? Terrestrial. I mean, just, you know, just uh, like, I mean, you know, I really believe he's from Saturn. I mean, I, I, I don't have any doubts, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, we met him because uh, Philip Michael Thomas real quick had him, had him uh, from uh, Miami Vice, had a theater on 125th and Dixie Highway called the Miami Way, had the pyramid on the top. And um, he, Philip was a good customer, and he would come in regularly, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm bringing in Sun Ra. And we're all, <laughs> we're all fucking Sun Ra fans. So we're like, great. He goes, uh, we're like, hey, I got to get tickets. He goes, no, no, better than he said, I want you guys to do the concession. I'm like, okay. So we ended up doing the concession. And then after the show, you know, we saw the show and everything. And then after the, after the show, they all came out, you know, Pat Patrick's and, and Ra and, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, John Gilmore and, you know, all of them, you know, the orchestra. They came to the table and we were giving them cards and they were buying records and we, oh, it was wonderful. We invited them to the store. We said, you know, right up the street. It was 125th, 163rd, close. So sure enough, you know, we didn't have a guarantee, but apparently we, might, we must have made a good impression on them. <laughs> About, it was like, it was, I remember it was the summertime, it was hot, it was really mid-August or something, and the car pulls up, and it's sunrise, he's out, and he's got these wires on his head, and he's got this great dashiki, and all kinds of multicolors and everything, and he sat out there, and out of nowhere, I guess people must have knew he was coming, I don't know how they knew, I mean, but they, but for some reason, I looked out, like a minute later, and there must have been 30 people, and it was really hot. So I said, come on, you know, Mr. Rod, you know, come on, please come in. You know, it's too hot. Sit outside. And he came in and, uh, and Gilmore. And we, uh, uh, the first thing he said to me, he says, um, we were playing a Duke Ellington um, uh, album on, on Victor from the thirties. And he said, uh, that's Duke. He says, but it sounds funny. It doesn't sound funny. And I said, well, it's a CD. He said, that's why, you know, so, uh, he came in and, you know, he sat down and cooled off for a bit. And then he, um, I said, you want to, is any here? And she said, yeah, I'm going to look around. So he, I, I kind of walked with him, I, you know, in front of him. And I showed him, uh, he asked me about Bobby Timmons. So I, I showed him the Bobby Timmons section. We had like four or five albums. And he pulled out uh, the album of this here. 
by Bobby Timmons. And he said, you know, he was a student of mine. And I'm thinking, well, you know, who isn't a student of yours, you know? But, uh, you know, but anyway, we went to the store and he, he pulled a few things. And one of my employees had a, had a uh, 45 that, um, that they did in the 50s. It was a doo-wop record. And it was called uh, Daddy, Don't You Tell Me No Lies. And, uh, you know, it's a Doo, Daddy, Don't You Tell Me No Lies. It was like a freaking doo-wop. It ain't like, you know, not, you would never think it was Sun Ra, but it was great. Sun Ra and the orchestra. And, um, and he, he got the biggest kick out of that because, you know, and he said, you know, I don't even have that copy. And my employee gave it to him, gave him his, uh, you know, I, f I found a copy last year. It was kind of beat up. You know, somebody offered me $300 for it, but I, I, I wanted to keep it. I want to sell it. The same record, you know, on, it was on Saturn. It had, a, it had a maroon label, Saturn. Very, very hard to find. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, you know, and then he came to the counter and he sat down and that's when he just started talking about, you know, um, everything from interstellar space, uh, um, you know, planets lining and just, you know, just amazing, just amazing. And he, you know, we, and nobody was on, everybody was just kind of lean. The cool thing is like, everybody was hanging on him. You know what I mean? Nobody was like, Oh, can you sign? Well, you know, he wasn't rushed. You know, I always made it a point of that when, I, when Jimmy Page came in the store and incognito, you know, you know, it was not like, Hey, we got Jimmy Page, you know, and we, you know what I mean? Otherwise you don't want to come back, you know? So, or, the, or people would recognize me. Is that Jimmy Page? Or, oh, can I get a garden? I said, you know what? Let him shop for a little bit. Wait till you're done. You know, the cool thing to do, I tell them, is buy an album. Go buy a rec. Buy a CD. They like signing that because you know what? You, you, oh, okay. Yeah. And then they grab a, 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 a record flat. I go, no, not a record flat. You know, go buy something. That's what it's all about. You know what I mean? Support the artist. Buy a CD. Buy a record. Have them sign it. So and I always say, let him, let him, let him be. You know, I don't want to chase him out of the store. And Paige came back a uh, half a dozen times at least. At least we came in. He was recording it with uh, David Coverdale at Criteria again. Criteria, um, uh, the Paige Coverdale project on Geffen. I think Geffen offered them a ton of money to, to you know, to sign. And uh, uh, but he, but he came in looking. He was a kid in a candy store. Reminded me of myself. I had records that I wouldn't sell them. And he he called me the next day. He said, "Well, can you can you burn?" I go, "Yeah, I'll burn it for you." And then he was impatient. He say, "Oh, get, did you burn it? Did you burn it?" You know. And then you know he Paige would buy like everything from rockabilly. He bought uh, Gene Vincent box sets to uh, Fairport or Sandy Denny box sets. You know, he loved Ry Cooter. You know, I had some. You know, a guy named uh, Johnny Shines. I gave him this Johnny Shine CD that he went crazy for. Uh, I had I had an album um, that uh, I think I mentioned it. It was an album that Atlantic did. It was a promotional album only. And on one, when Led Zeppelin One came out, it was half the album was Zeppelin One, and the other one was Dusty Springfield, Dusty in Memphis. And you know, it's almost like Atlantic said, "Well, I don't know which one it's going to be—the hit, you know, you know, you know, Son of a Preacher Man, or uh, you know, uh, Communication Breakdown, you know." I, so Atlantic, Atlantic put the record out. And I had it behind the counter, but it was mine. You know, I wasn't going to sell it. It was like, people were like, what the hell? What is that? You know? So Paige, sure enough, he, he took the bait. What the hell is that? I mean, Paige never saw it. I'm like, come on, Jimmy. You don't have this? He goes, no. It's never came out in the UK. Hey, you know what I mean? So yeah, how much? I go, no, no, I ain't selling it. <laughs> you know? And it was funny because on the record, you had an English announcer. You dropped the needle and it was a snippet. It was only like 30 seconds. And it was the guy would the English guy would go on this the debut record. This is the Led Zeppelin with the communication breakdown. Nah, you know, 30 cent, 20 seconds fade. And that was the Led Zeppelin. And for the second number, you know, Paige went nuts. So I burnt him that. I burnt him a bunch of other stuff. I had a record by a group called, uh, no, not a group. I had a record by, um, uh, what's it, um, Billy Boy Arnold, English, uh, a blues, Chicago blues cat, monster heart player, killer. And I had it for years. It was on VJ. Very collectible now. <clears throat> and the reason being, because it's got two songs on there that he did uh, that the Yardbirds covered. You know, when Paige was the Yardbirds, uh, one of them was, uh, I ain't got you, but I ain't got you. And the other one was, I wish you would. So there's two great songs. So Paige asked me about specifically, he said, you have any Billy Boy on <laughs> I said, well, I don't have any anything for sale. I said, I got a CD, but it's not the VJ stuff. I says, he goes, no, nah, I want the VJ stuff. I said, okay. I said, well, I have the album. No, nah, you don't. I said, yeah, I got it in the back. He says, no, can I see it? I said, yeah, you can see it. I'm not selling it, but I'll, I'll, you know. 
go, go. So I took, I took the album and I brought it up to him and um, he, he took it out of my hands and he showed uh, Coverdale, David Coverdale. He goes, go, oh, David, this is the record that I'm like, oh, God, in England, I had this and he was so excited. You know, that, 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 you know, you know, that I had that could find it, you know, because he's, he's a deep collector, let's face it. And I felt good the fact that I could put him onto some stuff, you know. Um, but, yeah, I ended up burning that, too. He kept calling me, man. Oh, please, Bob. I said, yeah, come and get it tomorrow night. You can pick it up, you know. So that, that, that was kind of fun. But every time he came in, it was something different. One time, one of my employees had a, uh, a Dan Electro guitar. And uh, uh, we gave it to Paige. It was, and Paige was sitting behind my counter on, on this little funky funky stool that we had and he's playing as Dan Electro and I'm thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, what a, who, who would have thought of this? You know, get up in the morning, Jimmy Page behind your counter playing a Dan Electro. And then of course, as soon as he, the guy went to take a picture, he put it down because that would probably end up on eBay that, you know, Jimmy Page played this guitar and how much, you know, but uh, a lot of, a lot of different stories, you know, that, that was, that was kind of fun. Besides some of the names that we've talked about, was there yeah. anyone else? who walk through the record shop doors that you literally dropped everything you were doing and like, Oh my God, this person's in my store. <laughs> uh, let me see. There was so many. Um, yeah. Sun Ra was right up there, boy. Uh, uh, Matt Dillon and Cameron Diaz. That was a, that was kind of a cool, a cool uh, outing. You know, they, uh, they were doing something about Mary you know, done right here in Miami, you know, and um, uh Matt was as great as can be. Matt is a, uh, and still is, he's uh, one of the, one of the biggest uh, uh, Latin collectors in the country. He's got an amazing collection. Uh, he's bought stuff from me over the years. Uh, I used to do shows in New York, the WFMU show in the village. And every time I go there, Matt was the first one at Friday morning at nine o'clock in the morning was always at my table, you know, and uh, looking for, uh, you know, Bebo Valdez or, uh, Arsenio Rodriguez, eh, La Cumbachera, or, uh, you know, Chico O'Farrell, or, uh, you know, Bird, Bird uh, Latin Rec. I mean, just knowledgeable. I mean, I thought I knew Mel Latin. This guy's like in another freaking world. Matter of fact, he's doing a, a documentary now on a great Cuban singer named Felove, which uh, you should check out. I mean, that'll be coming out soon. It's F-E-L-L-O-V-E. And uh, I just found a 45, which I'm probably going to sell to him. Uh, but yeah, Matt, Matt was wonderful. And, and, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, he came in bought, and bought a lot of stuff and was just as nice as could be. I mean, I had a couple of girls that were young girls that were like, they went freaking crazy when he came in, you know, just all over him, you know, and, uh, Cameron Diaz, Cameron went in the rock room and was buying, uh, the germs and wanted Captain Beefheart and, and his Matt going <laughs> for, you know, Cuban records on Araito and the Rem you know, in Cuba, only got to be original Cuban pressings, you know? So yeah, that was pretty exciting. But you know, there's so many, you know, like Snoop and Jam Master J from uh, Run DMC, sweet guy, uh, Onyx, uh, ODB, you know, you, you look up and you see characters in your store, uh, De La Soul, um, just so many, so many greats, you know? Yeah. All but Sun Ra had to be had to be top of the list. That was that was one great afternoon where I stopped everything, man. <laughs> and then you know, then occasionally I would get <clears throat> some of the old timers who were really getting on, you know, and and because I closed in what two uh, two thousand nine, but in the early two thousands I would get when Henry Stone was still alive. I I I remember one time I was in the store, I was up on a ladder and I was replacing some light bulbs, you know, in the jazz room, and I looked down and it's Henry Stone. And Tom Dowd, two, two of my heroes, Henry started me in the business in 68. And Tom Dowd, you know, with, with Wexler and Criteria. And I looked down, you get those two, you get those two legends in your store. You're like, this shit can wait. And I, I came down, we spent the afternoon. I had a table set up back there. I had a little stage. I had a coffee bar. And I had some liquor in the cabinet. And we, we, he, uh, we, we spent like about three hours and Tom, Tom uh, was telling me everything about Atlantic Records in the early years when he recorded Monk and Coltrane and said that, said that the artists that he, 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 uh, he had the most difficult time with were the Rascals because they were always at each other's neck. And he says, yet they, they produced some of the greatest music ever. He says, but they, you, know, you couldn't put, put them in a room for five minutes and leave without them you know, fist fighting each other. You know? But I mean, little anecdotes like that, you know, just like, you know, you know. But uh, been blessed, you know, like, like I said, I said to see Henry and Tom and 
you know, here we are, you know, full circle, you know what I mean? To 2009, that's 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And uh, I had a chance to, to, you know, thank them, you know, how much they meant to me. I went to Henry's funeral and um, yeah. And Tom, Tom, when they did the uh, documentary for Tom, uh, the guy who put it all together, which is one of the amazing, amazing documentaries, Tom Dowd. <clears throat> uh, I, I gave him all my, my uh, original album so he could, so in that documentary, all those photos, are, I even did get credit on it, like all the 45s and the LPs, you know. And Tom would come in, Tom would come in and uh, I did, he recorded before Atlanta. He used to he used to produce stuff on Bethlehem, like Chris Connor and different albums like that, which I wasn't even that aware of. I, I you know, I just always associated Tom with Atlantic all these years. But, you know, he produced early years. He was re- producing for uh, Bethlehem records. So there's, there's j- great jazz records of Tom before Atlanta, you know. But yeah, anyway, lots, lots of good stuff. Yeah, with all the memories of the shop, what was it like for you on the last day when that was it? You were closing the brick and mortar? You know, bittersweet. Yeah, bittersweet. You know, um, it, was, it was actually it was harder leaving in, in the three months that I knew it was coming to an end. You know what I mean? That, 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 that getting rid of the seat, you know, get, get, you know, just, I had to liquidate stuff. I had to, I didn't dump. I mean, I, I, you know, I bought good CDs. I bought good records. So, you know, I had to storage, I had to put them in storage, you know, but I, but there was so much work cause I had three rooms and, um, and then I had a storage, I had a, a warehouse down the street with two floors. So we did that first, maybe a year before. And then slowly, because, you know, look, with downloading, you know, people weren't buying, they were burning CDs. You don't put the, you know, you can't put it back in the bottle, you know? So, I mean, they weren't buying CDs and not everybody was hooked on records. I was, that's what kept us going in all those years. I mean, when CDs were, I said earlier, in the nineties, you know, to early 2000, everybody was replacing their records with CDs. And we were, we were no, we were like every other, so we were booming. You know, and I was bringing in imports. I was bringing in stuff that wasn't available in the state. I was bringing in bootlegs, Beatle bootlegs. Guys would come in and buy three hundred dollars worth of shit. You know, I had customers like Paige would spend a thousand dollars on CDs. You know, I mean, you know, literally, I had Japanese collectors coming from Europe four or five times a year, and and European and England, UK guys that were buying twelve inch disco records, were buying Latin jazz, were buying Blue Note records, were buying, you know. So we were, you know, and the profits on vinyl, I mean, if you get a good record for hundred dollars, you were fortunate to buy it for five, you know, <laughs> that beats the hell out of making three bucks on the CD, you know, so do the math, but, but it, you know, it, it comes to an end, just like the record promotion at all, you know, you got to accept it, you know, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I even tried to keep it going. You remember I had the little, I had the little shop on Griffin road on Sterling rather because I had to look, everybody kind of saw the writing on the wall. I didn't have to say, I didn't fire anybody. I, that's one thing. I only fired one person in 25 years that I had that store. Everybody else either left on their own. And most of them were with me 20 to 23 years, a lot of them. <clears throat> but at the end, there was me and there was Leslie and there was Bobby. And, and that's, and I felt, okay, I'm going to open, I'm going to stay, keep them going. I'll open a little you know, a little warehouse, mini warehouse. I'll bring in some of the better stuff that we had, the CDs, and I'll take special orders. But, you know, it isn't the same, you know, and it's not, it's it just, you know, it didn't strike again, you know what I mean? And it, it wasn't meant to. I mean, I just wanted a place to get out of the house. I had a little loft. I would sit upstairs. <clears throat> Leslie would do my, do the internet stuff and, you know, eBay and whatever and sell stuff and, and host stuff. And I was still buying, going out and buying. And Bobby was selling in the in the in the store, you know, in the uh, warehouse. But uh, it, it got to the point that Bobby left, and then uh, I I said, you know what, the rents here are too crazy. Leslie, come over to the house. So she she came with me to the house, and we and we continued the the uh, the internet stuff up until Leslie's mom got got a little ill, and she left. So it you know it was just a gradient, you know. What I mean, it was not was never quick. It was never you know, but you know, people say, oh, why did you close? You know, they don't, they, you know, you, you, you had to, you know, you can't do this forever, you know? I mean, I had, I had a payroll of 12 people, you know, you know, with FICA and, and withholding and tax, you know, I, you know, I, I mean, 
I had some distributors, one distributor, I did $900,000 in one year. So it was a big, it wasn't, you know, that little funky place, man. We could, we could turn the shit out. We could turn it out. And we did. We turned it out. So, um, I, you know, I can't, you can't do that again. See, my, my operation, I mean, I see these mom and pop, they're great stores, all the local stuff. But my, my thing was deep catalog. You know, you could come in and have, find a Lee Morgan section or you could find a Sun Ra Captain Beefheart, like an Earth, Wind and Fire or, you know, anything. You know what I mean? They, we had the albums. We had the CDs. We had the cassettes. And in some cases, we had the eight tracks. I had customers who still wanted eight. I said, well, come on, man. You got to graduate. But I would buy eight tracks. If they were sealed, I'd buy them and I'd sell them. I sold Snoop eight tracks. So, uh, you know, if they were cool, I mean, Ohio players and stuff like that, you know. Four tops on you know, Motown eight tracks. Hell, this mothers of invention. And I wish I had the Velvet Underground on eight track that I had. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I sold them, but you know what? I got like three hundred bucks from them, so I'm, I'm, I'm cool. That, that paid a couple of guys, and you know, they paid the employees. You know, sure. That was my thing. Keep this going for as long as I could. I looked after everybody. That's why. That's why they stayed with me for twenty three years. If I was a prick. And that's why I think that's an testament to Bluno. If we didn't treat people right, we would have been out of there in five years. You know what I mean? We kept, they kept coming back. We had, they, they still call me and tell me how much they miss them. And I miss them, you know? But. With the resurgence of vinyl. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who was looking to maybe start their own record shop or their own online thing at some point? I, I think it's good. I had a guy that came into came to my house about a month ago. And, um, you know, I, I told him, I could see he had the passion, he had the love for it, and he, and he was pretty knowledgeable. Um, don't don't go into this thinking that you're going to get rich or you're going to, you know, that, oh, you know, uh, I mean, it's cool. It's a great, it's the coolest job in the world. You know what I mean? Working in a record shop um, or owning a record shop means great. But, you know, you, you got to know, know what you're doing, you know, you know. Um, you know, read up, you know, be, be passionate about the music and not, not just one style. You know what I mean? Just, you know, you know, broaden it, man, you know, go, go out there, you know? Um, and, 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 and most of these guys are, they're very, I mean, you know, people that, uh, 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 Tony and we got the beats, it's basically a dance store, but there's a lot of other, I mean, I can go in there and get any, any Miles Davis or Coltrane reissue or 180 that I want, you know, <clears throat> and, um, you know, the same with the other stores, but I, I just tell them, you know, like, go, go for it, man. You know, if you, if you really want it and you're passionate about it, you need, you know, need a little bit of funding, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, I opened up with it on a shoestring. I bought 2000 records in Key West and I probably had a couple thousand dollars to, to spend. So, I, you know, I mean, that's nothing, you know, but I, you know, from Acorns Grow Mighty Oaks, they say, you know, we, we parlayed that and, you know, we did well. I was, I was, I was in there, man. I was hands on, you know, I worked this, I worked this six and a half days a week, man. You know, I, I mean, I, you, you got to stay with it, you know, it's not, you can't leave it in the hands of, um, of uh, just anybody, you know, uh, you know, I mean, as great as your employees are, you know, you got, you got to stay on top of it, man, because, you know, they can, they can, they can pull it away very quickly. But uh, yeah, my advice is, I mean, if you, if you love it, man, then go for it, you know, just, just, you know, do your homework, you know, do your homework. I mean, for me, it was, it was a relatively easy transition because, you know, I, th I knew what to buy. I like this music. And, you know, if anything, I was like, maybe, maybe I liked it a little too much. I would bring in all the shit I like, you know, this is what you should be listening to, you know, and so for some reason I'll put these cool records on eBay and I'm like, why the fuck isn't anybody buying these, man? What the hell's wrong with them? And then I'll get somebody, I'll get like somebody three months later after it's been listed online. Whoa, they find it for the first time, you know? That just happened recently with some African CDs I, that I've had in storage for 10 years. And, uh, you know, Tabule and Rosharu and Torakunda and all these great African artists. And I, I'm looking at them and I brought them in from friggin' Senegal. I brought them in from Europe and England. And they're sealed and they're double CDs. And I get $25. And I'm like, God, these are all sealed. And I listed, I listed like about 25 African CDs. And sold them all to cats on the West Coast, San Francisco. I'm like, cool, man. And they're sealed. You know, people love sealed stuff, you know. But, I mean, here I am. I bought this stuff 20 years ago. It was cool then. It's cooler now because you can't get it, and you certainly can't get it sealed. <laughs> right. 
So that's what I'm talking about. Do your homework, man. Know this shit. <laughs> Listen to records. Go read books on the, on these great producers, man. I mean, Wexler's got a great book. Clive's got a great book. There's so many good ones, you know. Um, you know, just you know, and and respect these guys, man. I, you know, if nothing else, you know. And before long, believe me, you know, it, it doesn't take long for people to. That's why, you know, with John Fogarty, Bill Page, or, these people would seek you out. I had Art Crumb in the store buying Cuban 78s and buying, uh, you know, Dixieland stuff. And, uh, you know, they know. They know. If you get if you get the cool stuff and, and you know, you, you you go a little further, you know what I mean? You know, we, we would bring 78s. Not that we sold a ton, but you know what? When we had that person that wanted them, it was great. If Snoop wanted an 8-track and we had it, that was cool. He ain't forgetting that. If I met him today or tomorrow, I'd say, you remember you got that Drifters 8? Oh, yeah, man. I, they remember that. You know, and Sun Ra, you know, I'm sure he remembered, uh, you know, all those years giving him uh, uh, Daddy Don't Tell You No Lies, you know. And John Fogarty came in the store, and I, he said, that, hey, do you have Ike Turner? And I, and I knew he didn't mean Ike and Tina. And Ike Turner had a band in the 50s called the, uh, the 50s and 60s called the kings of rhythm love that love them and i had i had the kings of rhythm and i uh i actually he was in town for a few days promoting the centerfield album and i burnt him i made him a copy of uh all of the ike turner stuff you know so it's those things you know what i mean it's those kind of things i think that that separate separate you from from the rest you know anybody can buy the goddamn hits you know what i mean i mean like i remember when we were in business peaches and coconuts and vibrations and they would say oh go to blue note they got all that old shit well, that's the best thing they could say. Because you know what? If they came to Blue Note, we certainly can give the kids a Billy Joel record, but we'll find that Howlin' Wolf record that you're looking for, too. So they didn't leave Blue Note. So, the, you know, if they didn't want a special order at, at Coconuts or, or the Happy Note or any other of those stores, the best thing they did was say, go to Blue Note, man. Yeah, Bob, Bob will have it. He knows what you're talking about. That, that was us. We were the ones who, when all else failed, you know, radio stations, everybody, everybody would, you know, so we had all that shit going happening too. It was great. But yeah, I, in answer to your question, I say go for it, man. Just just know what you're getting into, you know. Yeah. It's one of the greatest gifts, though, you get from a record shop is just the recommendations from the folks that work there. And you also touched on something that I feel is so important to me. Something others who don't buy records always understand is when you pick out that record it invokes that memory. I know where I got that. I know what I was yeah. doing. I know where I yeah. was, all this yeah. stuff. It's just, you just, it's hard to describe, but you were just making me think about that when you were bringing that up about these other, you know, famous artists and stuff like that and having those moments. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's just one of those cool things that you just, just feel, you know? You said it, man. You said it. you remember when you got that, whether it was open books and records, Leslie, or, you know, you, you remember going in there and maybe getting turned on to that sub pop uh, seven inch uh, one sided or or uh, REM, uh, whatever, you know, uh, uh, hip top record or, you know, you always remember where you got it and you still got it. You know what I mean? That's how I am, man. If I pull a record out, somebody I'm playing, I was playing some records yesterday and um, it's a friend of mine who, again, when I opened in 84 and I put Blue Note the shingle. He was probably the second person in the door in 84. And I see him 30 some odd years later and he had a stroke and he came back from the dead and he came up and he pulled up and I, I, I was I'm so emotional, you know. Uh, I was so glad to see him. We spent three and a half hours and we talked and we, uh, we reminisced, but we played records. And I remember pulling out the Robert Johnson album and he goes, oh, my God. He says, he says, I got it. But he says, that's the original. And I opened it. And I says, you know, I bought this when I first came to Miami when I was working for Henry. I bought it at uh, a place called the uh, the Bookworm in Coral Gables. It was right on Miracle Mile. And there was a guy who was upstairs. And he had a tracheotomy so he, could, so he couldn't smoke weed, but he could drink tea all day, which is what he did. And I bought, I bought the Robert Johnson. And it was a six eye, you know, meaning a first pressing. And it said demonstration, not for sale. And on the back was red ink demo, you know. So it's an it's an original '60s pressing six eye, and I and I still play it. And 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 visions of me going and buying that record, and the price tag is still on it for two ninety nine, and it's now a thousand dollar record. Yeah. Wow. So, but 
that you're, you're right. You remember it. You never forget. You never forget. Or whether the time somebody turns you on to that, and you, you'll, those are, and, you know, if, if, if you don't understand that, then don't get in it. Don't, you know, you're in the wrong business, you know, cause you gotta, you gotta really, I mean, you'll learn. Everybody learns. We all learn every day, but you know, <clears throat> I, I got in it because I knew and, and I just wanted to represent. I still, still do, you know, still do. Yeah. And when you think about your legacy and you also being mm. such a devoted music fan, if you had to kind of pick that one song that was kind of sums up your life and everything like that, what would be that, that one tune that just really sums up wow. who Bob Perry is all about? Wow. I have to pick one song. Jesus Christ. I, I It's a jazz tune. Uh, Pharaoh Sanders. Um, the creator has a master plan. I don't know if you know that, but it's a beautiful tune. Yeah, you know it. Um, yeah, yeah. That That's probably one of them. Because it's the first time I did psilocybin. <laughs> and, that, and that record brought me back to, back to earth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just such a mar it's a marvelous I mean it, you know uh, you know there's this Coltrane is Charlie Parker's uh um we uh so many sunny stit you know but I, but I'd have to say uh, boy when uh, the creator has a master plan and uh that one every time I hear it it's like it stops me on my tracks and <clears throat> if I had to pick a second it would be uh Leon Thomas's song for my father uh which is a Horace Silver tune but He's, he did the lyrics to it. You know, it's, if there was ever a man who was generous, gracious, and good, it was my dad, the man I loved. And I had a chance to play that for my dad when, he, when I was on the bus, you know, and he was, he was sick with cancer. And um, he was on 95 with my, my then fiance, who I've been married to for 49 years. And um, she told me that, you know, he had tears in his eyes when, I, when he drove away, you know. So I was glad I was able to do that. But uh, yeah, definitely those two. Yeah, creator has a master plan. And, and uh, uh, Horace Silvers, or uh, Leon Thomas's version, rather. Song for my father. Yeah. Hmm, sorry, I got choked up there. <laughs> Bob, thank you so much for, pleasure. for, for sharing. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. And I'm just very... Uh, thankful that you took the time to share all these wonderful stories with all the listeners out there and just some just a remarkable career and you're still going of course but mm -hmm. all the things you all the things you did back in the you know the late 60s and 70s yeah. 80s 90s i mean my goodness <laughs> you're i can't wait for the book <laughs> <laughs> thanks I'm, I'm working on it everybody's telling me you got to do it bob so uh yeah i'm working on it. but thank you man i really enjoyed it and i hope uh I mean, uh, I hope your your fans and, and people listening uh, took some took a little something away. You know, I can I can go on and on about this because it's a, it's one of my favorite subjects. And I love love music and love talking about it. Uh, but but I you know it, it's been a blessing. I'm 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 so grateful for uh, you know to just to be still you know I'm a rep you know so I'm I'm grateful for that. But uh, hopefully somebody will uh, will get something out of it. And you're welcome to uh, you know send them my email. I don't you know whatever. Bob, thank you. My pleasure.